Welcome to Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about a hot time for cool roofs. You'll see what I mean. We're going to talk about passive cooling from highly reflective roof coatings and how this cooling reduces temperatures and saves money, energy, and lives. Our guest for the show is Ethan Allen, uh, formerly uh, a host here on Think Tech. In fact, the host of Likeable Science. Welcome to the show, your show, Ethan. Thank you, Jay. Good to be back here. Well, I have several questions for you, and um, let me let me begin by asking, uh, you know, the, the environmental questions, if you will. Sure. Um, you mentioned in your notes, you know, this, this we're going to talk about technologies from how going from simple white paint to adaptive radiate radiative photonic coatings and how they counteract the urban heat island and how they uh, uh, give give more efficiency at lower cost than other cooling approaches. So the first question is, what is an urban heat island or an urban heat island effect? We need to know how that works in order to address this. Sure. So basically because big cities uh, have lots and lots of concrete, typically, and big masses of pavement, uh, asphalt pavement or concrete pavement. They absorb a huge amount of heat during the day, and they build that heat up, and then they keep radiating it out. So cities typically are warmer than the surrounding countryside. Almost in every case we, we look, they are several degrees, in some cases quite a few degrees warmer uh, than the open countryside nearby, whether that be grasslands or farmland or forest or whatever. Um, so it, basically, if you look at maps, there are these spots, these heat spots in, uh, all the time, basically, that are urban centers, and they call them urban heat islands. And there are a variety of ways to try to counteract that, and cool roofs is one of the best, most efficient ways to do that. So we're calling it an urban heat island effect, but um, what about non-urban areas? What about rural areas? Does this have uh, any significant effect in, in the rural area? Absolutely. The, the cool roof idea is very strongly impacting on the structure you put it on. And it can be put on anything from a, a little cottage to a, a mega buildings. Uh, so and it can work very, very effectively to reduce temperatures, reduce the need for energy, reduce the need for uh energy sucking air conditioning. Uh, so yeah, it, it's very broadly applicable. Again, it's one of the things why it's so attractive. It, it can be widely used. It can be very cheap to implement. As I say, it can be as cheap as slapping coat of white paint on your roof. Uh, and, and yet you can also, there's some very interesting new high tech ways of looking at it. Yeah, we can, uh, can we go back and just discuss for a minute the circular effect of the urban heat island effect? How? how it um, not only, um, you know, heats up that area, but the area creates a need for greater air conditioning. That's the problem with urban heat islands is they raise the temperature. Therefore, more people want to do more air conditioning. Our typical, well, our, our air conditioning as we now do it sucks up a lot, of, a lot of energy. It cools your immediate inside space, but at the expense of dumping heat out in the outside environment. And so as more and more people use more and more air conditioning, you're dumping more and more heat into your already overheated urban heat island and making it hotter still, which means sort of a vicious cycle effect here. People need to then crank their air conditioner up further, which uses more energy and then dumps more heat out. And the more people who do this, the, the greater the need is to keep using more and more air conditioning. And so the beauty of cool roofs is they basically are, are offering at least a partial passive since you energy free alternative to it. Well, this is particularly relevant given the news over the, the summer months anyway, and probably going forward that uh, climate change is raising temperatures. And we've had some very, very hot temperatures, even fatally hot temperatures around the world. Yes. So if I have uh, the urban heat island effect and the temperatures are going higher and higher, that spiral up is even more threatening, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we we kill off thousands of people in the U.S. every year from from heat, direct heat problems, basically, and many, many more, probably several hundred thousand around the world. Particularly in the last couple of years, where we've had 
record-breaking hot years. 2023 was the world's hottest year. Uh, we just set in 2024 in July, we set the, the hottest day record one day and then broke that promptly the next day. Uh, so yeah, we are, we are in a real heat uh, wave here, but it's a very different kind of heat wave. It's not a heat wave that's going away. It's just building and building. So this becomes more and more uh, timely and appropriate. Yeah, so let's let's talk let's let's take a look at this from your vantage as a scientist. In fact, you are the think tech uh, company science scientist. So I, I want to make clear about that. Um, and so, uh, if I just paint my roof white, with ordinary white paint, and P.S. Ethan, I that's exactly what my roof right here in my house is like. Um, it's just white paint. But they told me when they painted it that it would help the temperatures inside. How does it do that if I just paint it white? Well, so in the same way, you probably have observed that if you walk out on a hot day and you're wearing a white shirt, you stay somewhat cooler than if you wear a black shirt. If you wear a black shirt, you can just feel your shirt heats up. You begin to absorb heat. And it's just simply a, a property that, that white reflects a much broader spectrum of light, whereas darker colors absorb that that light and that heat, basically. Uh, so you always want to keep things as light colored as possible uh, in, in that sense. Let me go a step further and ask you how that works. It's it's a matter of light waves and uh, my white shirt and my white roof is is going to reflect that. Um, gee, that, you know, that's so in so many ways. I mean, thinking of the uh, Arctic and the Antarctic and the ice and all that. And that has a lot to do with climate change. But uh, how does it work? So how does that work? Um, so the light comes down from the sun and it comes through whatever layers of atmosphere we have and it and it strikes something light colored. Um, mm -hmm. So from a scientific point of view, how does that differ from something black? Um, what happens at the, what do you want to call it? The photonic level. So, I mean, basically everything we, are, we see in the world it, almost everything we see in the world is reflected light. Very little is direct li direct source light. We see that only if you look right up at the sun, for instance, you're seeing direct source light or you look at a light bulb. Everything else is reflected light. Black does not reflect light, right? Black is, is the absence of reflection. That is almost the definition of black. White is the broadest reflector of visible spectrum light. It also happens to be that it's reflecting Heat, more heat carrying light at the long wavelength end of the spectrum. Uh, it's, it's bouncing that heat back. And again, the black is simply absorbing that heat. And then it has to re-radiate it basically that the object gets warmer and warmer, whether that's your shirt or the roof of your house or whatever, or your, your black or your dark car, right? It's going to be much hotter, much more quickly than your white car is in summer. What is the process of reflection? Let's assume I have something white and it catches certain waves of light and reflects. What is the process of reflection? Um, how, do, how does that work at the light wave level? This energy carrying particle is hitting a surface, right? Something has to happen. Basically, either it's going to be absorbed into that and all that energy will go on into that surface or else it's going to be bounced back from it, more or less. It can, in some cases, just be bent a little bit and sent on its way. Again, white surfaces or light colored surfaces reflect a much broader segment of the spectrum and reflect much more efficiently. So your white roof on your house probably is dropping, cutting 60% of the energy, something like that, that's impinging on it is now being bounced back. So yes, your, your builders were quite right. You're, you're gonna, your, heat, your air conditioning bill should go down because you put a white roof on. So it's a matter of energy. We yes. know that energy is coming down. Light is energy. Right. And uh, it's coming down. And the question is, how, how is it processed at the at the level of color? Hmm, that's so interesting. OK, right. so now let's talk about the chemistry of it and the nanotechnology uh, of adaptive radiative photonic coatings. Right. Um, what is what is that kind of coating? What does it do from a, a so, chemical nanotechnology point of view? So you may recall a number of years ago, we had I had a guest on Likeable Science, uh, uh, Oswath Rahman, Alan Oswath. Uh, he was a uh, recent graduate from the University of Washington in uh, the, the 
dual degree nanotechnology program that I had been running there. And he had developed along with some colleagues, a material that sort of seemed to violate the laws of physics. He basically had, if you think of him having kind of a square of this material and put it out in the sunlight and it will be cooler than the surrounding air. And indeed, if you moved into the shade, it would actually get warmer in the shade than it would be. It was basically taking a broad spectrum of incoming radiation. And because of its very special structure on the nanoscale, on the molecular scale, it was channeling all that into a very narrow window and reflecting it very efficiently back out. And the narrow window happens to be in what we call the near infrared, just beyond red in our spectrum. We can't see it, but it's, it's what heat really is. And within a limited spectrum there, our atmosphere is virtually transparent to that wavelength, that wavelength of light or that wavelength of energy, I should say. And therefore, you just dump energy out and it's just it's being there's a huge cold sink out there called the universe, basically, that uh, is basically almost at absolute zero. And so you just keep dumping energy out. So this material would actually it, it sort of seemed to cheat the laws of physics, but uh, it really wasn't. It was just rearranging the energy, basically pulling a broad spectrum of energy into a rather narrow channel and then dumping it out and thus producing a cooling effect. And that has since been now replicated and is now actually being commercially available, uh, being made commercially available in various products for, that, that do this phenomena to greater or lesser extents. That is picking up a, uh, light from a broad spectrum channeling it into a narrow spectrum where our atmosphere is transparent and just dumping it out. So they become effectively cooler than the surrounding uh, air. What's what's the magic trick at the chemical level or at the at the light level? What What is the magic ingredient, if you will, that enables this coating to do that? Yeah, his original uh, coating, I think, was multiple layers of silicon dioxide, which is basically sand or glass. And then hafnium dioxide, which is just another version, basically, of the same thing. And for some reason, I'm, I'm not a chemist. I don't pretend to be a chemist. Uh, that combination, by putting multiple layers in there, it takes in energy and then bounces, converts it, basically, changes it all to a wavelength of about 800 to 1300 micron, or 8 to 13 microns. Uh, 800, 1300 micrometers, uh, and reflects it and reflects it very efficiently. Now, so, what's the difference between um, radiative photonic coatings and adaptive radiative photonic coatings? Is it the same thing, or is there something more advanced when you call it adaptive? Yes, the, the new that's sort of the new trend now is this adaptive stuff. So if you think about it and you paint your roof with, with a radiative photonic coating, you're reflecting all the energy off of it. And that's wonderful, particularly here in the tropics, right? To do that. But if you think about it in the temperate zone, that may be fine in the summer, but then in the winter, you don't really want to reflect that winter sunlight off your house, right? You, you actually won't because your, your house is going to get colder, basically. So you want to actually absorb that. And there are now materials that basically sense the temperature and then adjust their reflectivity and stop being radiative photonic materials at a, below a certain temperature and start absorbing that heat. So it's rather neat trick again, totally, this is a property of the material itself. It is not any external energy source required for this. So again, I don't know how soon, how widely those the, that adaptive aspect can be applied in a wide, Broadly scaled, commercially available product, but uh, the, the uh, been impression just a few years really the the basic photonic reflective materials are coming to be more and more available now. It's brilliant, and it doesn't require power. It's just a coating. It's just brilliant. Uh, you got to give this guy credit for it. He must have uh, very valuable patents on this stuff, uh -huh. and that must affect the price. Can <laughs> I can I go to Home Depot and buy a uh, you know, a, a 10 gallon can of uh, um, adaptive or radiative photonic coating and come home and put it on my roof? Um, there are more and more products that are being advertised as having that kind of property. Um, I have not checked them out. I have not actually seen, I, 
I would hope somebody somewhere, some lab is, is paying some attention to this and trying to do a little bit of quality control because it's such a neat idea that anyone, you know, taking a nice brilliant white paint would, would love to call it that, right? You know, hey, look at this. This is going to be, you know, it's going to make your whole place cooler. Uh, and I suspect that there is some of that going on. So, you know, I can't, I don't want to say, yes, you can run down to Home Depot and get some good, good uh, radiative photonic coatings. But I know they are being developed. They are being processed. They are being put on some, in some coatings, various, various sorts of coatings that made available uh, on some scale now. Well, is this uh, an American thing? Um, is the, the fellow who um, you know invented this because it really is a fabulous in, invention? Um, is he man manufacturing or licensing this for manufacturing in the U.S. or is it available everywhere? Um, okay. You know, either either in the form that he designed it or in some alternative form where they they copied you know the the function. Yeah, I have not followed the commercialization of this too closely. Uh I know he was interested in its commercial applications. Clearly, Oswath understood this was, was a good thing he had done, was figured this out, and that people were going to want to have that property. Uh, I believe it is being, various versions of it are being manufactured in various different places now around the globe. I don't think it's a strictly a U.S. phenomenon. Um, and clearly, it's big applications are really in the tropics, so it should be being manufactured for instance, in India and in South Asia, uh, you know, th those would be places where it could be of particular value. Mm, I wonder how expensive it is, uh, and I wonder, I wonder what you need to do to actually apply it. You know, because it sounds very sophisticated. And I know too that with a lot of these roof coatings, you have to apply it correctly, or it deteriorates, it fails to work. Um, whatever. Um, and I wonder if this, if you, do you need um, some specialist to put it on or can you, once you get it, can you actually put it on yourself by sloshing it on your roof with a paintbrush or a roller um, um, like you do paint? I think it's, it's a reasonably sophisticated process. Um, that is just as you, you can take and slap white paint over your shingles and make them more reflective. But it's really better to get shingles that are already made as white. They're actually going to do a better job at reflecting. People actually, the manufacturers of shingles put can put reflective coatings in them that bounce much more of the heat away and don't absorb it. Even though the shingle may look black, it's actually going to be bouncing a lot of heat off of it. Uh, because again, it's, it's bouncing sort of the invisible heat off of it. Um, and in similar ways, any kind of whether they're metal tiles, ceramic tiles, concrete tiles, or even uh, another any sort of coating you may have on a flat roof, um, there are uh, built-in reflective surfaces that are quite good, quite eff effective, long-lasting. They're, they're really part of the material. You can do a sort of uh, after-sale application, just as you could paint your black shingles, white, but it's never going to be nearly as good. It's probably going to not last as long, not be as effective, not be as efficient. You know, so yeah, it's, this is still, you know, we're still in relatively the early stages of this. I'm guessing people, I've heard that they make this stuff now in a liquid form that you can actually apply a, a like paint and it somehow sorts itself out. Uh, I don't quite understand that, quite frankly. Um, it seemed to me his original formulation was a very structured formulation. Uh, so maybe they figured out how to make this stuff self-structure when it when it's in a liquid form. I, I, I do not know. You know, it, it occurs to me that if you wanted to reflect radiation, if you wanted to reflect um, energy and light, you could use something that approaches a mirror also. Uh, so I suppose when you look at, at this kind of coating, it's white. But suppose you you use a kind of silver paint, um, or you you know you created something that approaches uh, the functionality of a mirror. Would yes. that have the same effect or be less effective? No, this is indeed Oswath's original material was actually a mirror. It reflected all the visible light too, and it was shiny, silvery. Um, but that's not a necessary part of it. You can get more or less the same effect with a white surface too. People would be mm. 
the aircraft industry, I suspect in particular, would be very upset if everyone started putting mirrors on their on their roof. Uh, <laughs> we're bouncing a, a lot of sunlight back up into pilots' faces uh, when they're trying to come and land in a in a busy airport. You know, with with multiple suns bouncing into their into their field view, that 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 could be a little distracting, I would think. Well, you know, the idea of reflecting radiation is interesting, and we've been. You know, hearing about uh, the the possibility of laser weapons, okay, um, and the laser laser weapons, uh, you know, can actually act like a weapon. And they can re they can shoot light, laser light, and right. and hurt people or destroy things. And I wonder if this is a, a necessary part or a useful part of the whole process of laser itself. In other words, if I can channel, reflect, maybe focus, uh, maybe concentrate this radi radiative energy, uh, can I use it for purposes other than simply cooling my roof? Interesting idea. Um, I mean, it, it already, in a sense, is concentrating the energy. That is, it's taking a broad spectrum of energy and channeling it into a rather narrow uh, set of wavelengths and then reflecting it back out. Um, in a sense, though, I mean, it, it's, it's supposed to do one thing. It, it, by that very property, it, it, it cools eff effectively in a passive, non-energy using way, right? It's, it's simply by its very, you know, what, it, what it is, is a cooling agent. So capturing that reflected energy in some sense, uh, why would you do it? What, what would you want to do with it? <laughs> Um, it probably end up a bunch of end up being dumped out as heat back into our environment again, which, which would the whole process, purpose of the thing. You know, you know the whole study of light is uh, really uh, I forget what's it called optics or something. Um, the the whole the whole study of light is is come light years. <laughs> oh wow, did I say that? <laughs> come light years in in the past twenty years. And we have learned so much about light and how to use light and change light and all that. Just think of, um, you know, photography. Um, just think of videography. Uh, mm -hmm. Light is has become an extraordinary study and science. And well, this is just another example of mm -hmm. how much we've learned about light and what we can do with light. It's, it's, a, <laughs> it's interesting and it reflects a much larger body of technical knowledge, right? Right. So there are now... For instance, coatings you can put on your windows that are clear, that actually absorb the, the light and heat and produce electricity. So your windows can become solar panels. There's even some that will do what your, uh, some eyeglasses do, right? Where they, if it's, the sunlight is bright, they shade themselves up, turn dark, and then turn turn back clear again when, when the sun is not there. Um, but yeah, how they can make, clear material, but that's also capturing energy it is, again, it almost seems like it's, it's bending some of the rules of physics a, a bit. But uh, yeah, people are able to do very clever things with, with light and, and uh, ambient energy now. Well, this particular technology, the radiative photonic coating technology, is very interesting because it, it, it deals directly or very close to directly with climate change. But I think people have to make the distinction between a, a technology like this and a technology which, uh, you know, makes makes electrical energy more efficient, uh, which generates renewable, clean energy. This isn't generating any energy at all. Um, so where does it fit, you know, in terms of dealing with climate change? You might think of it as being an extreme example of reflecting light back out. So people talk about now, you know, going up into the stratosphere and dumping out a bunch of sulfate particles or other particles to reflect the energy off before it gets into the lower atmosphere and heats things up. And indeed, we know that works, right? We've had big volcanic eruptions that have then been followed by a year or two of quite cold temperatures around the whole planet because they've dumped a bunch of particles up into the stratosphere. And in the year or two it takes for those to settle out, they've blocked a lot of sunlight. The Earth is experience very cold winters, very cool springs and summers. Um, so we know that works. This is sort of a, a locally 
the local version of that. It says for this spot, we're gonna we're gonna do that very effectively. We're gonna take a lot of the incoming energy and we're gonna get rid of it. We're not gonna let it come in and absorb it and heat things up. We're gonna bounce it right back out in the space right now. So it goes for the proposition that in dealing with climate change, we have to have the full portfolio of things. Uh, we have to do everything we can from every vantage and every technology um, to ameliorate climate change. And this is one of those things. So therefore, it has a tremendous prospects around the world. Um, and I and I just wonder if, um, you know, those prospects are public, you know, going aside from here on think tech, I mean, you think, uh, uh, and whether those prospects are going to be realized in time, because energy, that is, um, energy and climate change, those issues are spiraling up, and we really have to do something about it. This could be a significant uh, addition to the portfolio. And I, I, I want to see it happen. We all want to see these kinds of things happen. But are they happening? What has to happen, for example, before the American military industrial complex actually starts using it, before manufacturers start manufacturing, before contractors start learning and actually applying it, and homeowners um, you know, f finding the the funding and and the, uh, the, the the what do you call it the will the homeowner will uh, to put it on their roofs because if we all did that it would be, it would be a major constituent uh, in the climate change portfolio I think yes no you're absolutely right uh, indeed the, there was a study done a couple of years ago uh, during a heat wave in London um, and they estimate that if the cool roof technology, not even necessarily radiative photonic, but just simply cool roofs had been widely used. London would have been something like two degrees cooler at that point in the middle of a heat wave. And two degrees is quite significant in, in, when you're talking a heat wave. Uh, Los Angeles has now incorporated and basically said any new housing roofs that they go in have to be cool roofs. And they, I don't know quite how tightly they define that, but basically... You can't go and do your standard black asphalt shingles anymore. Um, they just they won't, won't let you do that. So there are steps in the right direction. Are they enough? Probably not. Should it be happen faster? Absolutely. Um, I think as you know, energy costs continue to climb, that they will do more of it faster. This turns out in studies, the cool roof technologies turn out to be very economically competitive. Uh, you can stick uh, green roofs that is, you know, put a layer of soil and grow grass or trees or whatever on your roof. Uh, you can do green spaces in urban settings. Again, both of those are good things. Neither has the impact for the cost that cool roof technology does. Cool roof technology beats both of those by a significant amount. Putting solar panels on your roof, again, a great thing to do. The cool roof actually beats that out um, in terms of being economically more feasible. The costs of, that, of those photonic materials I think are dropping. I think we will see very much as with solar power, where the sort of the cost per area of those is going to come plummeting downward, basically, and then that'll be more and more broadly used. Well, I, yeah, let me uh, let me ask you about that. Um, okay, uh, so right now a lot of people use a lot of energy from the solar panels on their roof to cool their their house. Um, I mean, some of it may go to the refrigerator. We're not talking about refrigerators here in this discussion, but uh, a lot of it goes to cool their house with air conditioning, and that's a lot of energy. So if I use uh, this radiative photonic coating on my roof, I need less energy to cool the house. And okay. therefore, I don't have the same needs for solar panels, either in terms of the number of panels uh, or the efficiency of panels. I can get along with fewer panels that are, you know, less efficient perhaps than what I might otherwise require. How does this change, you know, the development, the industry of solar solar rooftop cells? Uh, will we be reducing the, uh, the solar the solar panels on our roofs as we increase the use of the radiative photonic coatings? It's not clear to me that it will actually reduce that. Um, what is it? One more, if you one more weapon in our arsenal uh, against global warming, against uh, the climate climate change and the heating up of our planet. Um, 
Yes, I mean, if you put a solar panel on, painting your roof beneath that solar panel with with stuff is not going to do much good. Uh, you're not really going to get much bang for your buck out of that. Um, but the, the two of them together can complement each other. You know, all of this stuff is very local, sort of locality dependent, depending upon what uh, your topography is, what your, are you south facing slope, north facing slope, all these kind of things can influence how, how much solar power, how much solar energy you're getting, and therefore how useful any one of these technologies may be. Um, so it, it, it's got to be looked at uh, in a, somewhat a case by case basis, but it's, it is another broadly usable uh, technology now that we have. I think the remarkable thing about this, and I really appreciate you coming on and talking about this, about adaptive radiative photonic coatings and the new technology that is emerging around that, um, is that it, it shows us that we, we haven't come to the, the end, that there's more out there, that science can provide more surprise solutions that we didn't think of before. Uh, we may have thought about white paint, but never, you know, never this kind of uh, special manufacturing process and special effect. So sure. I, I know this is a hard question, Ethan, but as our chief scientist, maybe you can take a stab at it. Well, what do you expect next uh, that will reduce temperatures at home, uh, that will reduce the need for energy at home, uh, and that will deal perhaps uh, more effectively with uh, climate change? Well, I mean, you you hinted at this earlier. That the fact is, people are getting much better at dealing with light and other uh, incoming radiation and doing productive things with that. They're now making um, clothing that that basically will uh, absorb that energy and not let it get to your skin. Basically, will will, will cool things off for you. Um, we are we're very much in this whole area, I think, at a, at a you know model T forward kind of uh, level of technology. You know it's amazing. It's amazing stuff, right? Model T was an incredible advance when it came out. Nowadays, it looks pretty funky, you know uh, because we have moved beyond that uh, to a considerable extent. And similarly, I, I suspect we're going to find more and more ways to uh, use and regulate the energy. I mean, the sun is pouring so much energy onto this planet. Uh, and the more we figure out better ways to use it, the better off we are. If we can uh, convert it to electricity neatly and cleanly through, for instance, solar power, as we now do, and or wind power, uh, we, we begin to get uh, a lot of benefits of having more power available more, more cheaply. And therefore, we have to use less carbon uh, producing, carbon intensive fossil fuels, which are contributing to global warming so much. Um, so, I mean, we are seeing those shifts being made. Uh, solar power, wind power are, are increasingly significant shares of, of the energy market now. Uh, coal production and coal powered plants, other than in some developing countries are basically seem like they are on their way out in terms of in Europe and the US, um, which is a good thing, right? But uh, yeah, we're, we're, it's, it's a it's a it's a multifaceted game, and it's we're different stages in different places in the world, and uh, has has to be uh, that transition has to be adapted to the, the local needs and local capacities for sure. Uh, you know, it occurs to me that uh, you mentioned the urban heat island effect, which uh, involves to some significant degree uh, the sidewalks and the roadways of our cities, uh, as well as the building surfaces, not necessarily limited to the roofs, but the buildings themselves. And I wonder how far away we might be to putting coatings on everything, uh, to putting coatings on you know, the sidewalks, which can get very hot, as you know, and the roadways, which can get very hot, absorbing all kinds of radiation, um, and either bounce that back and keep cooler, or even uh, translate that and you know change that into uh, electrical energy. Are we there? Are there any technologies that are cooking? Do you think? And if 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 so, 
um, would that have a significant effect on the urban heat island effect? I mean, certainly, yes. If we, if you can envision a city that all the roadways, all the sidewalks, and all the buildings were coated with photonic radiative photonic materials, the the urban heat island effect would, in theory, if it was broad enough coverage, it would disappear entirely. And indeed, you'd have urban cool spots, basically, <laughs> uh, because you'd be reflecting more energy out than this than the surrounding natural environments reflect out. Uh, but those are those reflective surfaces are somewhat delicate. You cannot, you can't just, you can't just paint it on and expect that it's going to last um, with people scuffing their feet all over it, cars running over it, et cetera. So I don't know how realistic it is to expect that they will be widely deployed on that level. Um, perhaps in the future, people will figure that out. Uh, they will figure out how, how to put it into some, you know, build that into a, a you know, tough, glassy surface or something that, that can be uh, actually a, a applied and won't you know won't wear out reasonably won't wear out quickly even if people are walking on it and driving on it and that would be great i mean you can imagine big parking lots reflecting off their your parking lot is cooler than the surrounding air rather than hotter you know that, that would be beautiful yeah yeah working in tandem with solar right uh, and renewables in general exactly. well ethan it, it's great that you're our chief scientist and it's great that uh, you're here with us today to discuss this. Uh, there's more to come, of course, and we should follow this this kind of photonic uh, coating, and we should uh, other cutting edge technologies that are uh, being developed in our time. We'll have to leave it there, but uh, thanks so much to our guest, Ethan Allen, a former host of Likeable Science, and that means that's his show. Thanks again, and thanks for watching. Aloha.